Hey everyone, welcome to the very first episode of Every Version Ever. My name is Jonathan North, and today I'm joined by my cousin Sarah to talk about several versions of Alice in Wonderland, all from the era of silent film. If you missed the trailer for this show, I encourage you to check that out for more detailed information about what to expect from this new podcast. But for today, the basic gist you should know is back when I was starting out on my YouTube channel, Sarah and I would frequently talk about various versions of Alice in Wonderland on my show, Wonderland Wednesday. It wasn't something I'd even thought of doing when I decided to get into YouTube, but from that series I amassed a small but loyal following. Wonderland Wednesday started with just me giving my short reviews of different versions of Alice in Wonderland, but when I found the 1903 silent version, Sarah surprised me by agreeing to join me to talk about it. That led to us doing another video on the 1910 version, and then the 1915 version, and we just kept going on after that. The experience I had making that show with Sarah led me to create more shows, and eventually a podcast, I Heart Movies, which incorporated Wonderland Wednesday as well as my other literary series, and eventually I decided to spin those off into the show you're listening to today. But since everything I do now really got started with reviewing the silent versions of Alice in Wonderland with Sarah, I thought it would be very fitting to go back to where it all began and make one full-length podcast talking about all of those versions that we've discovered while working on my YouTube channel. If you're interested in watching or re-watching those original reviews, I'll have them linked below. And since the films we are talking about are all in the public domain and available to watch online, I'll have them linked below as well. Okay, I think that's all I've got by way of introduction, so let's get into the very first episode of Every Version Ever. Okay, so most of these, I will actually have links for anyone listening, because most of them are on YouTube. They're all, as far as I know, they're all in the public domain. There's a couple of YouTube channels that I've found, Phantomwise and Curiouser and Curiouser, who, I've talked to Phantomwise, not Curiouser and Curiouser, but they're friends, and they're both really big into Alice, and they've been collecting old movie versions and just putting them on YouTube for people to watch, because otherwise we wouldn't have a way to watch them. The only one that I have here that was not in any way connected to them was the 1903 one, which is the one we're going to talk about first. And that one was from BFI, the British Film Institute. So even the plays are connected to them? I believe I found that through Phantomwise's blog. Okay. Anyway, this is the first version, the 1903 version. And very first adaptation ever. And honestly, one of my favorites that we've ever watched. Period. I wouldn't say it's one of my favorites, but I do enjoy it just for the historical value. But we have different tastes, so I know why it's your favorite. Do you? Do you, Jonathan? Just because of the historical factor is a much bigger factor for you. Plus the dresses. The dress, it's charming. Costumes. Like, yeah. I can watch this, and it's not boring. Honestly, I highly recommend, if you're going to watch some of these old ones, you told me to go ahead and review them. At, I mean, we would already seen them, but reviewing them at double speed. Put on some relaxing vintage guitar <laughs> on the 1903 version. It's charming. It's very charming. But I think one of the biggest words to describe the 1903 version is charming. Yeah. I would say that probably more than more so than any of the ones we're talking about today. They all have their own little charms about them, I guess you would say, but I would say the most charming one is probably 1903. One of the, it's in the top two for me. It's in the top <laughs> two. The only surviving print of this film is in the BFI National Archives, and that's why this one is on their channel, because... This is their copy that they've restored and put online for people to watch. One of the things that we've talked about when reviewing these is that with these older ver versions, they seem to be made for an audience that's already very, very familiar with the story. Mm -hmm. So this, unless you just love watching vintage film or antique film, this is not a good place to start with the Alice stories. You already need to be familiar that aside, if you do know the stories and if you do love historical dress or, you know, seeing seeing window and looking through the window into the past. This one, her hair is beautiful, her clothes are interesting. I believe this one, along with the 1910, did have the little dog in the garden. Mm -hmm. 
that's noteworthy. There's an absolutely gorgeous cat, which is... But yeah, this, this is, yeah, like this one, is of one of the that... things that makes this one of my favorites. I mean, yeah. it has these little white lips and it's all fluffy and adorable. It's one of the most... Pre uh, like, you're not going to see a Cheshire cat that's as precious as this one. The Cheshire mm -hmm. cat tends to be really out there. This one, somebody had a really gorgeous pet that mm -hmm. made a vignette. Yeah, I don't think, I can't really even think of another version that the Cheshire Cat is a real cat like this. And this one was so gorgeous and fluffy, and I love animals, so yes, definitely, definitely. Also, this one, the Executioner was a little boy, mm -hmm. and she boxed his ears. <laughs> It almost looked more like she shoved him because he kind of went flying off screen, stumbling <laughs> backwards. It was all, it, you know, it's hammy. And the the cards are all of these school children. Mm -hmm. And you can tell that, that they're playing around, that they were coached. That I mean, it just adds to the charm. Mm -hmm. So, number one descriptor, you have it right there. It's not too long. And I'd say, if you're like me... If you ever crave, you know, the beauty of old times, if you want to dig into history, you know, grab a cup of tea and watch this one. It's not a big commitment, and it'll do your heart good. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're feeling really melancholy and whatever, but I can't, I can't help you. You just have to dig deep. Anyway. About this one, I liked the, I guess... I'll go back to the word charming, the special effects, because they were really simple, but they were effective. And it wasn't like they were trying too hard to do things that they couldn't do. It was like they worked with what they had, and it just, it sort of worked. It was charming. That's like the best word to describe what they were trying to do with it. <laughs> You're going to get sick of us and be like, okay, move on to the 1910 version. We get it. It's charming. <laughs> but it is. Yeah, I just... I just liked how they did, like, the shrinking and growing. And even, like, going down the tunnel, it wasn't like she's falling down. Like, that's not going to be something that they're going to be easily able to pull off in 1903. So they just had them walk down a tunnel. And the rabbit hole was a giant dirt hole in the ground. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, like, it's not, like, particularly accurate, accurate to the book, but... In this just, instance, I'm totally willing to forgive them. Yeah, I. It could become a drudgery if they had tried too hard. Not that they couldn't have done done more, but for for this, it's fine the way it is. Mm -hmm. In the 1910 version, one of the things that differentiates it from the 1903 is that you do actually have a little girl playing Alice. Where mm -hmm. in 1903, you have. A responsible adult. <laughs> and she's a pretty little brunette girl, I think with sausage curls. And um, the Mad Hatter is a little boy as well. So you kind of move on to the children's version of the children's story. And some of the descriptive cards are succinct and others quote directly from the book. And this one... The 1910 version, this one, we reviewed this like three years ago now, but the version that we have now to watch is a far higher quality than the one that we watched years ago, <laughs> because I remember watching it and not being able to see a bunch of it, mm. but now we're going back to where I found these, Curiouser and Curiouser, it was on their channel, they just uploaded at the end of last year. They had inquired at the Library of Congress where the where this film was being kept, and they were given a copy, a much better copy than what was out there on the internet. These people are hardcore. Yeah, definitely. And they cleaned it up themselves and uploaded it for Man. people to watch. Wow. So reviewing it this time was a, a better experience <laughs> just watching it That's because right. it was so... This makes me think of bird watching where it's like, I've, I've sighted dozens of species and other people are like, I've sighted hundreds. <laughs> it's like, okay, good for you. I'm 
proud that I just saw some bald eagles. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we we watched these old versions. Well, we went to the Library of Congress, <laughs> got a copy, and cleaned it up ourselves. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but like, I thought that was really cool, and I really appreciate that they took the time to do that. Yeah, no, I'm I'm not saying thank you sarcastically. <laughs> um, I also noticed this one, which I don't believe the 1903 version did, had the cards painting the roses. Mm-hmm. Also, this is kind of a tiny detail, but on the a proclamation for the trial, it has a little picture on it of a seal. And inside of the seal, it says seal. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of like, so this. kind of like the royal seal. Only yeah. the seal is a seal that says seal. <laughs> and I don't remember noticing that when we watched it before. Probably, so, we probably couldn't even see it. Maybe they and cleaned I'm... it up so that we can see the seal that says seal inside of the seal. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I was probably too busy trying to take notes as I watched. I did not notice that this time either. It's one of those things. We could take you scene by scene, but I would say watch our old reviews. Yeah, I'll have them linked in the description. I think it's nice for you all to know what are the little things that differentiate these. What are the little nuggets to look for? Mm -hmm. And look for the seal. It's cute. (laughs) One of my favorite things of this one, you already mentioned the kids, but <laughs> I loved at the Mad Tea Party, the Dormouse is a plush, and then the two kids playing the March Hare and the Mad Hatter, stuffing him in the teapot and like right. pounding on him. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot, and that's true. I think, really I, think I remember that now. Yes. Yeah. They, they hammed it up. <laughs> one of the things that I personally like about this version and they, they also did some special effect type, type mm-hmm. thing in here. Types of things. But this was totally not a special effect. I like it when she wakes up and her gorgeous sister in her fancy white dress and fancy hair is there. And I can stare at it from 1910. <laughs> well, that makes me happy. I don't think that they were trying to replicate the 1800s with Alice or with her sister so much. I feel like they modeled 1910 more than the period when the book was written. So also same with the 1903. So if you love that period, then that's what you're going to be looking at, not the 1800s. Anyway, (laughs) for the people who care, (laughs) which if you're, if you're, listening to this podcast there's a chance that you actually do (laughs) 1915 one this one is from phantom wise this one uh yes i remember this one not being my favorite and it's still (laughs) not my favorite i remember that as i was watching and the rabbit was making his creepy gestures i was (laughs) I was remembering Sarah's <laughs> revulsion. <laughs> this one, I think that they they took it in an interesting direction because it starts out with her in her home and they create all of these scenes where it's obviously playing into what she dreams about and they talk about how what you see influences your dreams. Mm-hmm. So they kind of take some of the magic out of it. It's yeah. like they're trying to deflate some of the craziness of Wonderland. Also, should you be picking up a white rabbit by its ears? I thought of that too. That doesn't seem right. She did that. So, kids, be gentle with your bunnies. Mm-hmm. And it moves very slowly. Like, at least at the beginning. Yeah. When you put it on, if you put it on double speed, a lot of it seems like a little bit more of a normal pace. If you're watching at regular speed, it drags. Her going into Wonderland, Mm -hmm. that takes forever. Yeah, the first two, when I rewatched 1903 and 1910, I didn't watch them on double speed. When I started watching this one, I was like, yeah, I'm putting this on double speed. (laughs) And it has the, the rabbit sort of creepily and dreamily beckoning her to dreamland and 
then she basically rises up out of her body, <laughs> which, I mean, maybe they were really happy with that effect. I didn't care for it. <laughs> They did have a little bit more detail in the rabbit hole, though, didn't they? I think in that version. Either that it was 1910. Am I yeah. muffing that? <laughs> no, this, the 1910 version, That I guess we didn't really talk about the special effects in the 1910 version. I think they did a decent job with the 1910 special effects. The rabbit hole was one where it was really simple. They, I think they just had her stand on something, and maybe they blew a fan to move her hair a little bit sure. and then they sort of animated a background like falling down a hole and it was really just a hole there wasn't like stuff in the hole whereas in 1915 there's stuff in the hole there are yeah. bats in the hole yeah it says floating down the old well for some reason <laughs> okay. and then they've got stuff for her to fall past and it was kind of hard to see so i don't know if that was just a not that great special effect, or if just the film is decaying. So, I don't know. It was decent. Yeah, and they, they included they included the mouse, which was... Weird. <laughs> <laughs> the mouse is kind of ugly. And I, really, like, I was thinking, is the mouse the same costume as the Dormouse later? Because I, it looked the same to me. Oh, I did not catch that. Like, but... it's... The same costume seems to show up at least three times, unless they have multiple costumes that look very similar, and I just couldn't see. Because it is kind of hard to see, but I could have sworn that that mouse was there multiple times as different characters. Or maybe the same character just showing up multiple times. I wonder what the budget was for their film. That would be interesting to know. I don't know. They had a lot of costumes. This was the crawling version. <laughs> This was the crawling version of Alice. You're going to have people in costumes crawling in ways that you could have done without. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those. At some point, when we're getting around the caucus race, you have Bill the Lizard, who doesn't really seem like he should be there, but he there was, is. There was a lot of characters in that scene that I didn't think should have been there. Like, even the Mock Turtle and... It's either the March Hare or a different White Rabbit that was there, but I could have sworn it was the White Rabbit, but just different. Which really seems to happen with Alice, where they like to jumble things up. And... Mm -hmm. Even a walrus was there. We have walruses later on in the film that they've added into the lobster quadrille scene, but they had the walruses there at the animal convention, which, probably <laughs> which is the caucus just, race. <laughs> which probably just helps to fluff it out on a budget. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they just used any animal costume that they had in that scene. But Bill didn't, didn't... Bill didn't even have a scene later. They just had a lizard here. <laughs> unless, also... unless it had been cut, because this version has had significant cuts happen to you, it. You sort of have Bill awkwardly crawling, and you have the, the caterpillar crawling, so... Mm -hmm. Keyword crawling. <laughs> and, and really, it's, we're talking about all these different things in the same scene. They're all the same size, even though they wouldn't be, because Alice grows and shrinks in the original story. She doesn't grow and shrink at all in this version, other than one scene when she meets the caterpillar, and he tells her that those sides of the mushroom will make her grow and shrink. And then there's a title card that tells you that she tried it and grew and shrank. But she doesn't actually grow and shrink on screen. So every character is all the same size, I guess, because they just all show up together. It's more probably... Closer to a play, but with yeah, with some special effects, yeah, put in. But I just thought that was kind of funny that they have all these scenes where she's supposed to grow and shrink and she doesn't, and then the one scene with the mushroom, they just have a title card saying that she tried it. <laughs> <laughs> Use your imagination, kids. Yeah, and the scene with the rabbit's house, I'm kind of wondering if that's one of those ones where scenes were cut out because. She's just sort of following the rabbit, and she sneaks into his house. She doesn't grow and shrink, but the rabbit's, like, trying to get into the house through a window, even though he was just in the house through the door. It was it was confusing. It was, I felt like something was missing, and I've, I've read a bunch about this. There are scenes that have been cut out, because originally this version was both stories. It was a two-hour film, with the first half being Alice Wonderland, the second half being Through the Looking Glass. It was cut apart first to two films, and then people just kept making cuts. Eventually, Through the Looking Glass is basically lost, though we do have a scene that Phantom Wise has uploaded. 
You know what wasn't lost? What? In the rabbit's house. Did you notice anything cute? <laughs> Was there a little bottle that you loved? No! When she goes up the stairs... Okay, pay attention, guys. Because the newel post on the stairs is a bunny. Oh, I think I noticed that, but I didn't really... It didn't strike me as something particularly cute, but I guess I, I can see why you would think it it's is. It's a nice little touch. Like, yeah. they totally didn't have to do that, but it's like, it's Rabbit's House. We're going to make the newel post a bunny. So, yeah. I liked it. Got to give them credit. I mean, with their weird out of body and slowness and everything, I've, I've handed out enough criticism. Got to compliment something here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even though there was a lot of weird choices in this, you could tell that they did care about what they were doing because they did put a lot of work into a lot of things. Like, even though the costumes weren't, to, at least to me, they weren't particularly cute or magnificent, if they were supposed to be magnificent, I they think, did put a lot of work into them. And I think that if I, I'm thinking of her sister's dress, I think that they may have leaned a little bit more towards period correctness with the clothing. I'd have to go back and scrutinize, but yeah, they they really they were trying hard to tell the tale. But I I wish that they hadn't tried to kind of explain away everything. I don't know. Yeah, that's like one of those things where what like a big writing thing is show not tell, and they were definitely telling. <laughs> like they could have just had them walk past like an owl. Because an owl is in the beginning and it, the owls show up later. And they could have had the walk past Dinah in the tree, which is supposed to be right. reference to the Cheshire With, Cat. Yeah, without saying, act, you know, being blatant about how this is going to influence her dream. Yeah, I think that one title card is what kind of ruined the magic. If they hadn't put that in there and just had them kind of walk past them or look up and see it. Sure. It would have just been nice foreshadowing. Sure. Instead of, hey, look what we're doing. <laughs> For... Some credit should be given to them as well that they did act out Father William. Yeah, that's something that a scene, lot of versions just don't do at all. Which I don't need it to be happy, but I think that they should be given credit that they went to that level of detail. Mm -hmm. This is also the first version where you're going to see uh, the Duchess and I believe the cook wearing giant puppet heads. <laughs> and the, I, I just thought it was hilarious. But the baby that the Duchess is holding is like terrified. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like the live baby? Yes, it was a real baby. <laughs> I, you cannot blame the baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what is this monster that's got a hold of me? <laughs> <laughs> Does she have an axe? <laughs> no, it's Pepper. <laughs> And the scene you're also introduced to the Cheshire Cat, <laughs> who is shuffling um. weirdly on the floor in this scene, <laughs> and then it's in a tree being even weirder <laughs> later. <laughs> oh yes, that's oh that's always going to be worth mentioning, probably. <laughs> this, this this is one of the creepiest Cheshire Cats in a way because they. The costume, like, especially for the scene with the costume disappearing, leaving the head behind, it's really, it just looks like a beheaded Cheshire cat. Yeah, they just <laughs> took the head off of the costume and left it in the tree. <laughs> it's just like they left his head there. Uh, yeah. Oh, and this one had a very, very homely hatter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the... Hatter was not the best. Yeah, it was not his fault. It was a giant head. Yeah. That somebody needed to have uh, done differently. I think they were trying to go illustration correct. But they, they didn't quite get there. That was wrong. This one also had a scene stuffing the Dormouse into the teapot. But it was like, there was no teapot there before, and then all of a sudden there was a giant teapot <laughs> that they're trying to stuff a full-grown <laughs> human into. They just had it onto the table or something. Yeah. <laughs> Tea party scene didn't last a whole long time, and then Alice sort of marches away. She finds a door in a tree 
which leads to the garden, and then you have the whole scene with the painting the roses. And I just, <laughs> I don't know why, it struck me really funny that the queen comes in, orders the cards beheaded, and marches away. Everybody follows, no beheading happens, <laughs> and then all the cards run away. <laughs> so it's like, I'm not sure if that was intentional to show that the queen is not really caring about who she's ordering beheaded, like she doesn't really care if they're beheaded or not, or if it was just they didn't they didn't film any scene that had them potentially getting some sort of punishment. It was just they ran away. It's just it made me laugh. For the sake of time. <laughs> just run away. Yeah. Then you have the croquet game with limp flamingos, which I guess is better than live flamingos, but it just struck me as funny how floppy and wobbly the flamingo props were. <laughs> in case you were in doubt, no flamingos were harmed. And this is one that has the Cheshire Cat, his head appearing in the sky, sort of. It's like, like a cartoon? Almost? I don't know what they're... Like, the special effect was <laughs> not that great. The, you know what they should have done? They should have had somebody up in a tree. <laughs> With it hanging from a string, just <laughs> jostling it around. At... <laughs> that would have been so much better than what they had. <laughs> oh my goodness, that would have. Oh my goodness. Because it was really hard to see. I would have loved it if they had done that. <laughs> and it would have been so terrible. We would have. We would have either been disturbed or laughed and laughed. Anyway, we weren't there when they needed us. <laughs> We almost need to do our own <laughs> silent spin-off version, <laughs> like with the sepia film, and just make it terrible on purpose. That would be hilarious and fun. <laughs> <laughs> and the Hatter can die in this one, too. Just all, <laughs> some of the worst things that have ever happened, just recreate them in a silent oh, spin-off. Right. With that little, little um, piano tinkling in the background. <laughs> Someday when we have a budget for costumes, we definitely should. <laughs> we don't need one because if it's the worst, <laughs> if it's the worst Alice ever. <laughs> oh my goodness. We could get together and have a paper mache party where we make hideous heads. <laughs> and just like have paper mache hair and doily hats or something. Oh, this sounds great. <laughs> now I want to do this. <laughs> So if the folks, if this ever comes out on YouTube, it started here. I actually have a Mad Hatter costume that I got years ago for a party. Oh, that's true. That's true. <laughs> oh my goodness. We, we have lots of cats. Face. <laughs> we have lots of cats. Yeah. Many Dinahs. And Cheshire Cats. Which one would be the Cheshire Cat? Oh, probably Little Red. <laughs> Tim could be the griffin, just strap some <laughs> wings on him. <laughs> he looks grumpy enough. Anyway. I think we've we've gone <laughs> off the rails. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> oh dear. I was going to talk about another thing that I don't know if it was supposed to be funny or not, but I found it hilarious. After the Cheshire Cat is there, the Queen is yelling, off with its head, off with everybody's head. And then the Executioner's chasing everyone around. <laughs> and sp specifically, he chases the White Rabbit off screen. <laughs> and I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> but then the King says, let's pardon everybody. <laughs> and, and then the, it's just done. And the Queen takes Alice to see the Mock Turtle. It was very abrupt. <laughs> but just the executioner chasing the white rabbit off screen was hilarious. In the book, was it the Duchess or the Queen that took her to the Mock Turtle? Or to the Griffin, that is. I think the Queen. Okay. Good for them. The Duchess the Duchess oh, was yeah. there, but she was either you or your head must be off. Yes. Yeah. There we go. And then this is the one with the this is the version that has the Grippin with the floppy, floppy hands. I think you said Grippin. This is the one with the griffin with the <laughs> floppy, floppy hands. Oh, dear. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> I don't remember being disturbed, but... We all, we all have our things. We all have our things. Like me and the versions of the rabbit, this might have been one of them with his creepy man hands. 
<laughs> yeah, I think yeah, he did have bare hands yeah. in this one. <laughs> the mock turtle looks fine. Which is has, not always the case, so yeah. credit should be given. Yeah. He has floppy fins, but that's better than floppy hands. <laughs> and this honestly might be my favorite lobster quadrille. <laughs> Potentially. Potentially. That that has to be said for, they, for this version because the lobsters have striped trousers. It, they I they did really well with the costumes of the lobsters. They look like real lobsters. The only thing was when they're first coming out of the water, it looks kind of ominous. <laughs> like giant these creatures yeah, rising giant from lobsters the lobsters would not be attractive, and they're not. The thing that saves them <laughs> their are dapper the, pants. Their dapper pants <laughs> are great. <laughs> I wonder if they had red striped trousers. Honestly, in, in my mind, that they were red striped. <laughs> that is great. And the walruses. Yeah, the walruses they added into this scene, but I, I I liked them. They had little parasols. Which I did not catch immediately. It's Mr. and Mrs. Yeah. Walrus. It it took until maybe I noticed well, back at the time, but it took until the um through the looking glass yeah, clip. Because they come back. Right. When they specifically said it. Mm -hmm. Other than that, I was not paying enough attention, I guess. Because <laughs> I think I thought they were both guys. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it specified. In Which Alice really, Wonderland. to my credit or lack thereof, the lobsters, it was not Mr. and Mrs. Lobster. It was a couple of dudes in striped pants. So. <laughs> yeah. My question with the walruses was, were they being reused? Like, were the costumes reused from the walrus in the carpenter section? Because, like I said, this has been cut apart. Because oh. we have the looking glass. They did have a looking glass version as the second half of the movie. So I'm wondering if maybe this was costumes from that. I'm not sure because that part isn't in there. Like, the looking glass version picks up probably right after the Tweedle scene because it mentions a fight. Question. The lobster quadrille, would that have been... Walruses and lobsters, or would have been porpoises and lobsters? Porpoises. Okay, okay. So they were taking liberty. Yeah. Yes, it's been a while since I read the book. <laughs> and like Phantom Wise, who probably reads it every night and <laughs> restores film and stuff. Probably has Wonderland tattooed on their back. <laughs> you didn't get that from me. I don't know if that's true or not. <laughs> just the whole map or just the word Wonderland? No, the whole map. The whole map. <laughs> oh, and if you get any ideas about that, don't do it. <laughs> It'll disqualify you from donating blood. <laughs> Life advice with Sarah. <laughs> You're welcome. Anyway. After the quadro, she's called to the trial. Yeah, uh, this another thing. That <laughs> yes, made, this kind of made me laugh because the rabbit collects her, and the card says he calls the little folk from hill and dale, <laughs> and he's just blowing his trumpet around a hill randomly. <laughs> it's not supposed to be funny, but it made me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> It's probably your, your British ancestry or something. I don't know. <laughs> but this all basically happened as normal, except the mouse came back again and just kind of weirdly laid down in the middle of the courtroom. <laughs> <laughs> and didn't, wasn't there a special, there was a special effect where the cards were sort of spinning, yeah. right? Yeah, the, your... Well, did they overlay? No, that something? was nineteen ten. Oh, that was nineteen ten. Because well, we this should have mentioned that. Yeah, well, we can mention it now. Okay. We're doing all three. In, in Forgive the... us. <laughs> we packed in all, all the. We're packing in all of the silent versions, and it's something to try and keep track of. Yeah. All the little details between them. Yeah, yeah. It's that nineteen ten. That was the one where, at the very end, all the people sort of turned into cards in a nineteen ten ish special effect. And then sort of spun around okay. as she transitioned back into the real world. And what happened in the 1915 one? They kind of rained sort from of the flew. ceiling. like <laughs> I thought of it like a sprinkler went off and it was oh. all cards. <laughs> and then she wakes up on the bank and the white rabbit that she picked up by the ears is still there. 
he didn't make his escape like he should have. <laughs> mm. Tolerant pets. <laughs> and then they leave, and that's the end. And then we have the looking glass section that we can talk about. This is another thing that Fandomwise uploaded. This was basically just the ending scene of the movie because that's all that's left. Like, the rest has been lost. Like I said earlier, it mentions a fight, which is probably the Tweedles, and then goes to the White Knight. And this version has a chess piece for a head and body. It's like a chess piece with arms and legs. Hmm. And then, for some reason, the White Rabbit is called Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of funny. <laughs> He's trying to find Alice, and this is this is weird. Like Alice sits down in the woods, and then he just appears behind her. And he's not. He doesn't. He's not supposed to be there anyway. Yeah, he puts on the crown. Like he puts the crown on her head, gives her the scepter, and disappears again. And then the queens appear next to her. It it's just kind of weird. It's like they were trying... I think maybe they just figured out how they could cut the film, and they liked the effect, and, she, and they just wanted to do it a couple times. She doesn't know how the crown got there, right? And yeah, she has no idea how it got there. She just notices it. And then they have a conversation. Like It's probably... They don't... There's not too many title cards, so the conversation doesn't last as long as it does in the book. And then they disappear again. And then Alice says, they vanished, just like the Cheshire Cat. Which, I mean, it works. Yeah, it's just kind of weird that they did that. I just, I'm not sure why they did the whole disappearing thing with all the characters. But then the rabbit appears again. And then they go to the castle for the banquet. And then it's basically a clip show of all the people from the movie. Like, the whole thing, like Alice in Wonderland as well. Right. Coming to the party. Right. All the costumes. Yes, I think they just wanted to use them again because we got to get our money out of these costumes. And the frog and fish from Alice in Wonderland are there serving. I they, don't think that's book accurate. They didn't leave out the weird leg of mutton, though. <laughs> yeah, it was just there. They didn't do much with it, but it was there. They didn't include the pudding. And the Mad Hatter was there, and I, I liked that they had him, He they had a card for him to say, so like my tea party. <laughs> it, just, it cracked me up. It would have been interesting if they had had giant insects and a man in a newspaper suit, but I don't remember seeing that. No, they probably cut those out. No, I don't know. No but. humanoid goat. <sighs> no. Maybe for the best. <laughs> It probably would have been creepy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. And then this one ends with a little card that says, Life, what is it but a dream? <sighs> <sighs> Nobody take that seriously. <laughs> Which, is that how, I think that's how one of his poems ended, wasn't it? I'm not sure. I just thought it was... Yeah, like, I don't think row, that they row, were. Row I don't think that they were necessarily trying to be specifically deep there. I think that that might have actually been taken. Uh, I wish that I'm. I'm a little upset that I don't know for sure, but I feel like you know, you know how sometimes it begins mm -hmm. and ends with his poems. In the second poem, I think it may end with that line. It might. Not necessarily for through the looking glass, though. I do. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> but that's the end of the movie. Yeah. Or what's they took, left of it. They took liberties, the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there isn't much, there really isn't much to see, about 15 minutes worth yeah. of the 1950s. It's one of those things that, looking glass. it's interesting from a historical perspective, but. But barely. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was interesting to watch just because I like seeing what people did in the past to try and adapt these stories, but I wouldn't say it's the most entertaining thing to watch. For it's like the the version of Alice in Wonderland is kind of unintentionally funny. Like I found so much to laugh at that I thought was funny that I don't think it was supposed to be funny, and I don't know how many other people are going to find it funny. But well, I found it funny. Thankfully, the the people who made it aren't around to be sad that he's <laughs> laughing at it. Yeah. Then we have a couple of short films. These. I found a mention of these on FandomWise's blog. I'm pretty sure that's what led me to these. There's, back in the 1920s and 30s, 
and I think it might still be there. I need to figure this out. But there was the Kitsap Forest Theater, which is a theater that was, like, out in the middle of a forest with, like, different levels. Like, people sat in these things that are sort of set up like bleachers, but it's just logs, logs in the dirt. But, like, up a hill for people to sit on and watch. I have questions, though, if they still have it, whether people are still sitting on logs. Because, I mean, yeah. the 20s, they had different concept of comfort. <laughs> Yeah, but it's just a really interesting idea for a theater, like, out in the middle of a forest. And they have, like, yeah. the different levels for people, like, to go up. There's, like, different stages and different levels of the forest. And they built them up with Wonderland stuff, like they had big mushrooms and things. I think if I were to make a top ten of favorites that we've watched, I'd, I'd, I'd like to think that this one would be on it mainly because of historical interest because yeah. you see people arriving to watch the play and you get to see what normal people were wearing mm -hmm. this is one of those things where it's more interesting from the historical perspective than the actual adaptation itself oh yeah the adaptation itself is thin at best but you get all the people arriving and you see like real people from that time. Right. And also the imagination that they put into adapting it to an open air theater setting. Yeah. You don't get every, you don't get the whole story because you get the impression as you're watching it, at least I did, and probably you too, mm -hmm. that there was probably a lot of dialogue yeah. that did not have a card. Yeah. You they, could see people talking, but it didn't have any cards for them they to kept, say what they were saying. They kept the cards very succinct. And once again, like with the others, but perhaps even more so with this one, it's not for you to watch if you have no clue about the story. Yeah. Now, if you want to see a great piece of footage from the 1920s showing regular people having a good time and being creative... This is awesome. Mm -hmm. They even have backstage. Yeah. Before or after the play. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the white rabbit's fooling around, pretending to groom his little head and, or mm -hmm. his big head. <laughs> yeah, he, he, he was a method actor. He stayed in character even backstage. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, it's fun. Her hair is interesting. The, mm -hmm. the, the, to the costuming, they included these weird little fairies. Yeah. To help, um, you know, wake her up from her dream. One of mm -hmm. them does. And they made it work. Before the play even started, you, I was like, I was wondering what the deal was with the man with the sandwich board. And, it was like, and then he turned and I realized that it was one of the cards <laughs> out in the crowd. Yeah. There's a lot of little things to notice like that in this version. This is one of those things that it's hard to really describe, so I'm going to link to where you can find these films. They're not on YouTube, unfortunately, but I will link to where I found them so that if you're interested, you can watch them. Do watch the 1927 one. Yeah, once you get to the 1931 one, it is really hard to see what's going on. Like, it that, was not as well preserved. That one is, kind of, this one is sad on more than one level because it's so blurry that for me, it's hardly worth looking at. And that's me mm -hmm. who thinks that this stuff is so interesting. So if you're going to watch one, watch the 27 one. If you're really curious, go ahead and watch the 31 as well. It's not that long, but yes, it is. It's, I mean, it's it's really bad. And really, it's almost the same thing again, except filmed even worse, because they're filming from a much bigger distance. It's almost like a home movie, rather than trying to actually film the scenes. I don't think you get the same... You don't get the same behind the scenes. You don't get, no. the, you don't get the crowd arriving. I'm, I'm talking, like, of the story aspect, like what they were trying to film, because the story is all jumbled up. To me, that's has... kind of disappointing, too, as well, because you have all of these characters coming out onto the chessboard that belong in the first book. Yeah. And it's like they're just trying to celebrate the characters rather than properly telling the story. Yeah. It... And I didn't care for that as much. The title card said that it was adapting through the looking glass, but it was really just a jumble of both books. And I'm 
I'm somewhat forgiving. I, I think fairly forgiving of intermingling the two stories. Mm -hmm. But with this one, it was just kind of ridiculous. And I They didn't do it well. It was just random scenes, really. It would be almost like if you had a child that just loved Disney characters. And so you just brought them all out into the room, you know, without properly telling anybody's story. Yeah, that's kind of a good analogy. It really is like a kid trying to remember a story and telling it with their own characters in whatever order they feel like. Oh, that's not what I was thinking. But, <laughs> but however you want to interpret these statements, that's what was going on. It was just really jumbly, that's what we're saying. And, and yeah, it didn't do it justice. So, yeah. yeah, that one, not so hot, not so interesting, not properly done. But the 27 one is very interesting. Yeah. Also noteworthy in that one is the white rabbit ending up with the duchess <laughs> yeah that one i get we found out later like we recorded these there was more than one i think that had that happen and we were like really confused and then people filled us in in the comments that there was a play i can't remember if the play was actually called Alice in Wonder. i think they had a slightly different name but it was this one specific play that made that change, and then a bunch of different versions used that aspect in their version. They just kept readapting this one specific play. Yeah, so know that that's not true to the book, but it does happen. So in this one, it's kind of funny and charming and weird at the same yeah. time, but whatever. <laughs> it's a play out in the woods with yeah fairies that have antennae and dark pants so there's there's a lot of like slightly weird things in this version but we're watching it for the historical value and just the interesting setting rather than book accuracy it would be so interesting to just step into that world for a second and see what they think of our accents for you know listen to their american accents versus ours mm -hmm. so you know it would have been different yeah but anyway yeah, out of, out of the silent versions, my favorites are 1903 and the 1927 open-air play. Mine are probably 03 and 10, just because different cute or charming aspects. I really like that there was kids in the 1910 version, mm. and the Mad mm. Hatter as a child, that I did, I really liked that yeah, version. Yeah, that is cute. Plus the whole pounding on the dormouse, trying to stuff him in the teapot. It just cracked me up. Oh, we should also quickly mention the mushrooms and the macaroni of oh, 1927. Yes. We were revisiting the article, then we remembered from a few years ago when we talked about this the first time. I had forgotten, us up. I had forgotten the mushrooms, but I had remembered... The matrimony. They had giant mushrooms as props, and there were tourists who thought that they were real. Yeah. And then, which I guess if you've never been somewhere, yeah, maybe you would wonder. And then one thing that, when I read it, it just made me laugh because I remembered reading this and I remember talking about this, the specific phrase that they used, because apparently there was two different couples that got together and got married the actor who played the executioner and the actress who played the mock turtle and then the mad hatter and the cook they were all married but they described this as an epidemic of matrimony hit <laughs> the actors <laughs> it's just i love that phrase it's so weird like nobody talks like that anymore <laughs> i don't know how much they talked like that back then but i love it that it, i love that it happened <laughs> yeah it's so cozy yeah Anyway, I guess that's probably all we have to say about these. They're worth watching for people who are interested in Alice, for people who are interested in old films. Which, Just the historical perspective makes them something special. We've talked about them all individually, but this gives you a condensed idea of all the ones that you can watch, if you so choose. Mm -hmm. Pros and cons, our favorites... Yeah. Yeah, I will have links to all of them. And if you are interested, you can check them out. Yep. Make a cup of tea, play some vintage music, and get your antique Alice on. 
Yeah. Thanks to Sarah for joining me for this first episode of Every Version Ever. Like I teased in the trailer for this show, in the first few months of the podcast, I'll be using a mix of new and old content to create episodes. For many versions of Alice in Wonderland and other stories I've already covered, we've already talked at length about them, and the videos we made for YouTube will already make for great podcast content, especially if it's a movie that we talked about for so long that we had to split it up into two, three, or even four episodes. So while I get the show off the ground, I'll be going back and re-editing or re-releasing classic episodes of Wonderland Wednesday, The Christmas Carol Countdown, and any other show that will be transitioning into the Every Version Ever series. Next time we'll be going back to one of Sarah's and my personal favorites when we talked about an extremely strange version of Alice in Wonderland, a Czechoslovakian version from 1988. It's definitely a trip, but we enjoyed it and had so much fun recording our review. I'm really excited to revisit it as a podcast, so we'll see you then on the next episode of Every Version Ever. Thanks for listening.